Soccer is a lifelong passion of mine. And inspired by the excitement I feel every four years when the Soccer World Cup takes place, I want to share with you an art project that tells the history of the Soccer World Cup. The idea is to use visual art to tell the story of each World Cup tournament, starting with the first World Cup in 1930 in Uruguay. Seen here with the location of its capital, Montevideo, where all the games were played. This piece on the inaugural 1930 World Cup incorporates facts, figures, photos, and diagrams about the tournament and its historical context. For example, the results, goal scores, stadiums, etc. for all the games from the group stages to the final. Nearly 60 years went by from the first international game of soccer between England and Scotland in 1872 to the first World Cup. In those 60 years, the popularity of soccer grew and FIFA was formed. However, the timing of the first World Cup was a bit unfortunate as it fell at the beginning of the Great Depression. So even though all FIFA nations were invited to participate, most European sides were not willing or able to make the trip. So when the Scottish-built transatlantic ocean liner SS Conteverde left Europe on June 21st, 1930, only teams from France, Belgium, Romania and Yugoslavia were on board. Plus FIFA's president, Jules Rimet, carrying the World Cup trophy in his suitcase. The ship picked up Brazil on their way and the European nations arrived in Montevideo after 15 days of sailing. Uruguay, as the defending champions at both the 1924 and 1928 Olympic Games, was chosen by FIFA to be the first host nation of the World Cup. All games were to be played in the capital Montevideo, where they built the momentous Estadio Centenario, also referred to as the Temple of Football, with a planned capacity of 90,000 spectators. A 100-meter-tall landmark tower called the Tower of Tribute was built at the top of the stadium's Olympic Tribune to mark the 100th anniversary of Uruguay's constitution following the country's independence in 1825. Estadio Centenario was declared a historical monument of football by FIFA in 1983, and it is still the home field of the Uruguayan national team. The Golden Boot the award given to the top scorer of each World Cup was first introduced as an award in the 1982 World Cup in Spain. But top scorers in earlier World Cups are also recognized as Golden Boot winners. And in the first World Cup in 1930 in Uruguay, that player was Argentina's Guillermo Stabile. Stabile's story is special because he never played for Argentina before or after the 1930 World Cup where he was also watching from the bench in Argentina's first game against France. Nonetheless, in his only four games for his country at the 1930 World Cup, he scored a hat-trick in his debut game against Mexico and a total of eight goals. And after his World Cup success, he was signed by Genoa in Italy, where he also scored a hat-trick in his first game for the club. Later, as a manager, he led Argentina to victory at six South American championships. The Golden Ball, the award given to the best player in each World Cup, was also first introduced as an official award in the 1982 World Cup in Spain. But panels of international experts and soccer historians have over the years agreed upon a selection of the best players in previous World Cups. And for the 1930 World Cup in Uruguay, there is consensus that that player was the Uruguayan captain, Jose Nasasi. Known as the Great Marshal, Nasasi is regarded by many as Uruguay's greatest ever player. By the time he led Uruguay to the World Championship at home in 1930, he had already won the 1924 and 1928 Olympic gold for his country, and the 1923, 1924, and 1926 South American Championship. I don't know about you, but I sure wish I could have been among the 93,000 spectators at Estadio Centenario when Nasasi and his teammates turned a 1-2 deficit into a 4-2 victory over Argentina in the 1930 World Cup Final. 
Although he didn't win any individual award in the 1930 World Cup, José Leandro Andrade was one of the finest soccer players in the world at the time, and he deserves to be included in my Sayard portrait of the tournament. Known as the Black Marvel, the Uruguayan halfback was not a prolific goal scorer, but he was known for enabling and assisting the talented Uruguayan front line with his forward runs and passes. Andrade was one of the first great black international players and one of the few black players in a South American side in the 1930 World Cup. In addition to the 1930 World Cup, he won two Olympic gold medals with Uruguay and three Copa Americas. Posters have played a key role in publicizing the World Cup since its inception. The poster at the first World Cup was created by Guillermo Laborde, a Uruguayan sculptor and painter. And as you can see, it was very contemporary and industrial in its design. The poster depicted the goalkeeper, dressed in the color blue of the Uruguayan team, catching a ball, and the number one as a reference to this being the first World Cup. And as you can see, I have incorporated the design of the poster into the background of my sci art piece on the tournament. The poster was also used for other artifacts such as enameled pins and patches or flyers and posters announcing the teams and dates and times of the games of the tournament. The final of the 1930 World Cup was between the host nation Uruguay and Argentina, their South American rivals from across the River Plate. The Belgian referee John Longinus was a central figure in the First World Cup not only because he officiated four matches, and for all games, no matter how hot it was, was wearing a suit and a cap, and not because he was almost attacked in the semi-final when the American team doctor, in his anger over a call, came running onto the field and started screaming at Longinus, threw down his medical bag, only to break a bottle of chloroform and pass out. No, Longinus is remembered primarily because he was chosen to referee the final game between the two South American rivals. Thousands of fans from Argentina sailed across the river in anything that could float, and in Montevideo the tensions between the fans grew. And John Longinus demanded from the Uruguayan organizers a guarantee of the safety of him and his linesmen, and a quick escape plan to get back to his ship no matter what occurred in the game. But he was faced with an unexpected problem even before the game had started. The tradition of an official tournament ball had not yet been established, and teams supplied their own for each match. So for the final, both the Argentinians and the Uruguayans demanded they played with their own type of ball. And John Longinus famously decided that the first half should be played with the Tiento, provided by Argentina and the second half should be played with the larger and heavier T model provided by Uruguay. Whether and how much it had to do with the ball, Argentina won the first half with their ball by a score of 2-1, to one. but Uruguay came back and won the second half with their ball by a score of 3-0, to zero, and thus the World Cup final in a 4-2 to two victory. This was the first and only case of home ball advantage in a World Cup. There are still many more details and layers in this sci art piece telling the story of the first World Cup in Uruguay in 1930. So if you're curious and interested, 